Okay, hello everybody. Good morning. It's Thursday. I actually had to ask someone yesterday what day it was. I've totally forgotten because they're all melding into one. And but I'm really lucky this morning to be joined by the magnificent Melanie Wood. And she's like the most amazing storyteller. And I think you're going to really enjoy a conversation where you better enjoy it. Hey, Melanie, how are you going? Uh, good, thanks, Annette. I'm super excited to be on this morning. And hello to everybody tuning in live or, or later on. I'm super excited to, to yeah, share a little bit more and um, and help in any way I can today. Oh, no, it's, um, we, we've all had to kind of change how we communicate and connect with people, haven't we? Yeah, that's right, exactly. And it, it suddenly becomes like super foreign for a lot of people going, how do I go from in person to online and how do I still keep my own self and own authenticity going on as well? <laughs> oh, and that's the big thing, isn't it? Let's just give people a bit of context because we're going to talk about storytelling. Um, you love it, I love it, obviously yeah. obsessed with loves it because that's what we're all about. How yeah. did you get a business called Speaking Styles? But yeah. how did you get into helping people share their stories? Yeah, and thank you so much for asking. And, and I love sharing it. And so I'm going to go back a little while because then just as we're talking about stories, I want to give people a bit of context around um, things that have happened to me in my past that have led me up to today to do what I do. It's sometimes like we get into something that we think it's actually been years in the making to actually be where you're at. And and I used to be in my um, childhood, um, I used to be really petrified of public speaking. However, I was really fearless in everything else in life. Like I, I lived in Europe when I was 17. I used to travel. Like I used to just do so much adventure in my life. And up until I was around um, 18, I had this ticket to America and I was going to do Camp America. For me, my big dream was to immigrate to another country from Scotland because it rained all the time. And um, so I had a one-way ticket to go to America and I thought that's where I'm going to start my life. And I went on this night out because in Scotland, um, it's a massive drinking culture. And I went on a night out and um, I was very, very drunk. And this guy had approached me from, you know, the other side of the dance floor with this white shirt. And when you're really, really drunk, you're just like someone's coming to save me or, you know, take me away from this. And um, so this guy ended up being my husband. And um, so I was about 18 and we got married when I was 21. And that night in Shining Armour, that night when I was drunk, wasn't actually what actually happened to me. Um, I didn't marry my, my Prince Charming. I actually married the man of my nightmares. And for six years, I was actually in an abusive marriage. And, um, and at that time, I really lost so much of that fearless person that was, you know, the world was her oyster. She was going to travel the world and, and just really be that fearless person. And really for six years, I lost so much of myself. I really looked into committing suicide because I just didn't know how to get out of that situation. And I was actually in a workplace at the time and I was experiencing a lot of bullying and harassment. And I and again, I look back in it and it was probably because of the way I was behaving as well because of what was going on. And I didn't want anybody to know what was going on behind closed doors. So I was very good at, you know, around four or five years of turning up every day with a mask on as if my life was perfect behind the scenes. And I just didn't know how to, I suppose, act and communicate with people. So I probably wasn't that that nicer colleague um, at the time. And um, and it was actually around probably about three or four years later, um, a colleague um, of mine had actually reached out to me. So this is why I'm, I'm so passionate about stories because it is the way in which we incite change. It is the way in which we can actually reach out and help one another. And this particular colleague, I'd got to work in the morning and I just couldn't keep that mask on any longer. I just had hit a point of I'm done, I'm finished and I, and I really need help. And she took her shoes off and she put mine on and she had the courage to come and ask me if I was OK. And I had the courage to say, no, I'm not OK. 
And from that moment, she held my hand for an entire year of helping me be able to leave that marriage. And she never once said to me, you need to leave, you need to do this. And she'd experienced the same as me. And she literally took me by the hand um, and she was there for me every step of the way to build my confidence to then leave. And because she shared her story and I shared mine, we suddenly had this connection and this bond. And I'm so grateful to her because I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for her. And, and that's why stories are so, so important. And I think sometimes we underestimate the power of them. We underestimate the, you know, I suppose, taking that mask off and having the courage to share the story in order to help other people. And I remember that when I did leave him, I vowed and I said, you know, this is my time to go back to that 18 year old before you before she met them um, and got married was I'm going to go back to all that adventure and all of the things that I wanted to do. But until you've experienced something like that, you, you don't realize the trauma that you actually experience. And when you suddenly come away from it, um, I actually hated the world. I hated everybody in it. And I did nothing for 12 years because I was lost and I really just didn't know how to get to the next step. And so it took me 12 years before I really did anything about it. And um, just over seven years ago, I had the opportunity to come to Australia. And, um, and someone gave me the book, The Secret by Rhonda Byrne. And I was never exposed to self-development, spirituality, never. So somebody giving me the book, telling me to take responsibility for my life, what had happened, I just went, you can have that book back because yeah. that's Yes, right. Thank you. <laughs> and she said, read it again with an open mind. But my ego got the better of me. And I went, right, OK, I'll read it again with an open mind. And then I watched the documentary and something clicked in me. And I thought, you know, if I really want to change my life, something needs to change. And I was, you know, I had a ticket to come to Australia for a year and I thought, this is now my opportunity. I'm ready to change. And, and really from seven years ago, I've just immersed myself in so much development, so much spirituality, so much about overcoming my fear of public speaking. Um, and again, just to let people know that I was petrified of public speaking. I would avoid it at all costs and, um, and being able to overcome that. And I really just saw the power in when we can really have the courage to share our story, it really makes such a huge um, difference. Um, one person saved my life. And then when I shared my story in a blog four years ago, it actually saved somebody else's life. And the person that it actually saved was um, my ex-husband's current girlfriend at the time, who was given my blog at the time. We didn't know each other. And um, and I helped her leave him. And we're now such, such good friends. So I'm such a believer in that when we share our stories, it really can save people's lives. Oh, Melanie, I'm covered in goosebumps. When you said your colleague took off her shoes and put yours on. It is, isn't it so important that we yep. dispense with judgment and we yep. listen like I always, you know, I remember being told you've got two ears and a mouth, use yep. them in that proportion. So, um, wow. And so you're still friends with your ex's ex. Yeah, so um, I, that's me now. I went home for two months, Jan, uh, February, uh, December and January there. And um, when she got my blog four or five years ago, I was actually had a ticket to go home for a month and we met up for coffee. And that's really when our relationship started and I helped her to really move forward. And then when I went back just recently, we met up again for coffee and um, and it was just amazing because we have such a bond, I suppose, because it was the same person. Um, but yeah, we constantly connect on Facebook and, and we've kept that relationship up for over four years now, which has been amazing. That's really cool because a lot of people don't feel that their stories are worth telling. You know, yeah. even the, the and people who've been through a lot of pain think, well, why would I inflict that pain on somebody yeah. else? Yeah, that's right. And and I think that's what I say to people is, is that, and that's why I love sharing my story because I say, you know, I, I felt like that and it took me probably until the last 
one or two years to be fully comfortable to share fully my story and I now have shared it on quite a numerous amount of stages and, and on, on social media and you know and I say to people just remember don't feel like you need to share everything and be really super vulnerable it's just you know whether it's one-on-one -on -one conversations is dropping little bits in around something that you've experienced and 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 I say to people because people always say to me but I don't have a story like yours like how can I share my story when mine's not as dramatic or traumatic is yours and I say yeah but there's still parts of your life that you've overcome there's still parts of your journey that you've had highs and lows it doesn't need to be something massive as a transformation because for you it was massive um, but you just remember that we're all unique and we're all different we're all going through different things and each and every single person's story um, is so valuable because it, it will help one other person you know every time that you do share it so that's what really important and it is about I suppose getting out of your own way so the more that we are really scared about sharing our story then I say to people but you're thinking too much about yourself and not about what you could actually do to impact someone else so that's really the the flipping stage of going I'm going to share it anyway mm, that's a really important point and I know from um, my career as a journalist and, and working in the the storytelling space that when like I can remember I'd get so I used to write for the senior newspaper so I was 50s and above which oh my god I'm 50 in a month it'll be my newspaper soon uh, <laughs> and you know I'd ring these people who had been volunteering for Meals on Wheels for 30 40 years or who had been prisoners of concentration camps or you know like these amazing stories of survival and you'd ring them and you'd say I'd like to talk to you and interview and they'd go oh darling I'm like nobody would really be interested in my story but you just don't know do you the one person needs to hear it for you to have uh, an, an impact definitely and and sometimes we don't and, and I suppose it's that thing of not looking for the external validation or approval for sharing your story because not everybody necessarily will come and say to you and and but they would go away and really kind of go oh wow and maybe in six months time they go I remember when I heard that person's story I'm now ready to make a difference in my life so it's about being able to share your story and not necessarily having any sort of feedback or outcome or approval from it it's just it's something and the more you share your story the more healing it is for you because you're not just sweeping it under the carpet and a lot of people will say to me yeah but I don't really want to go back to it but honestly I can say that it's so therapeutic and so healing when you can verbally communicate what you've been through but get to a point where you go it's now about the other pe other people and it's not about me anymore. Um, and I think that's what's really important. And somebody said that to me the, the other day about how, what I do to help people and run workshops. And, and she said, you know, is this therapeutic to you? And I said, well, I've actually never thought about it because I'm so into helping other people. But the more I came away from it, I said, actually, it is. Like, I think that's why I love about it is because it is actually really therapeutic for me. But I'm also there and providing a safe environment for other people to do the same. So you were so young when that happened to you. Yeah. Um, nothing really prepared us for the the horrible narcissistic people mm. that come into our life. To do with there's no rule book. No. No, absolutely not. And it was something I suppose I just I wasn't expecting. But when you're so young, you kind of and I'm not saying that's just young because it can be for any of us is that we think oh the person will change. I'm going to be here to fix that person. And you know, they'll change, it will be fine. And then once you get further into it, you realize they're not going to change, but you don't actually have the energy, the courage, the confidence. And the, the for me, it was a lot of around guilt and shame. It was around, you know, I'm married now and, you know, it's not a it's not a same thing back then that you suddenly leave your husband and get a divorce. And all of my friends were married. You know, I would be the only one to then be um, divorced. And I had a lot of shame and guilt around that, that I just didn't want to be a statistic around it. Yeah, no one wants to be a statistic. and But you don't set out in life to be a statistic, do you? No. 
we, no. we were born and we're loved by most of us are loved by our parents and we have dreams and goals and we go out into the world and then it like smacks us in the face with like a big wet smelly fish and you go this wasn't in the brochure hang on <laughs> <laughs> That's right, exactly. And and I suppose now when I when I look back and in, in, in that four years of when I did that blog, it was actually because I reached out to him to forgive him. And I wanted to reach that point where I wanted to be able to forgive him. And I know that's not easy for people to do, but I knew by reading The Secret, reading all of these types of books, that the only way for me to move forward and really truly do the work that I believed in to help others was I needed to forgive him and send him on his way and, and love him and bless him and send him on his way. And and that was really, I suppose, where the healing journey has began. Um, I mean, it's not as easy to forgive myself. I still have every day of battling with that, but to forgive myself for being in that situation. Um, that's something that's a massive work in progress for, for me. Um, but I think when we can be able to, to forgive, and this can be everyday people that might you know, do you the wrong thing or screw you over or whatever. I'm a big parent believer in, you know, just forgive them and send them on their way. Because at the end of the day, people go through things that they're going through and we react in, in different ways. And I think the more that you can, I suppose, rise above it and go, you know, there might just be other reasons to why that person is 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 responding or reacting that way. Basically what you're saying is there's no right or wrong when you share your story. Um, as, but maybe just as long as you share it with someone. You know, yeah. I, I think like in this world where, you know, we're told we're meant to have this purpose and a why and it can seem really big and really overwhelming because when you think about a purpose and a why, you know, immediately when I first heard that, it was like, well, shit, how am I going to change the world? Like I don't have any power until yeah. I realised that it could just be that one small thing that I do. Yeah, definitely. And and it is is like having these type, like I'm a big one for just conversations. And that's why like I loved what we'd said at the beginning. I love just being able to have conversations and there's not so much around structure because again I'm a big believer in you know what might come to me at the time of what potentially a listener um, might need to hear and and I think that's what's so important because it actually you then have a bit more freedom to then share certain things about yourself and certain things and I think yeah it is not looking at what is my big why yes there's that aspect of it but it's still just starting where you are with who you are what you have and you know I didn't set out to to start my own business I didn't set out to be on stage um I you know I, I didn't it just kind of evolved and, and and happened for me because the way that I was having conversations with people I was starting to you know coach and mentor people on the side around speaking and storytelling and then you know one thing after another just seemed to happen and it was as if like this is where I'm meant to be and 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 for me the the catalyst was for me was when I was in a job a few years ago and I collapsed and ended up in for emergency surgery and I went okay universe I'm here and you all right we're going to quit my job and we're going to go with this business now <laughs> how interesting is that and, and I think around this time at the moment where we're being encouraged to pivot and change and adapt and all of those wonderful adjectives that are being thrown at us yeah. is that um, when you find yourself in a situation where you are unhappy, is that it's okay to change? Oh, absolutely. And, and I think it comes down to that we, as a society, it's the thing of the expectations that we think that other people have on us to what we should and shouldn't be doing. And, and I think that you need to be true to yourself. And I think this is such an important time that storytelling and being able to share with people what you're going through, what's happening. And I think that's really what we can all be um, looking to do right now. And and and, and again, it's, it's, it's showing people and giving people permission to do the same. When we are in a position where we do have a little bit more courage to share certain things, but yeah, I think that, you know, change is always something that a humanly built that we kind of go, oh, that's super scary. You know, it's really uncomfortable. But, you know, sometimes it's actually looking at the bigger picture on if I change, what potentially could be an amazing thing that could happen out of it. Um, and I think that in life, we're all 
faced with change. It's just at the moment we've been faced on it with steroids, more than probably what we would normally in, in, embark and change at one thing at a time. But I think the way to look at it is and go, yes, it's on a massive scale. But again, for each individual person, what's one thing at a time that I could still be able to do in my life, in my work, whatever it is, what's one thing that I can be able to deal with and cope with right now? It doesn't have to be in a massive scale that you have to potentially change everything about your life because of it. <laughs> Absolutely. I, Haley's just said something really interesting. Which, uh, she must have read my mind. That <laughs> judgment and expectation is the worst and it creates, you know, you know I see so many people who have so much to give on social media and what an amazing platform Facebook is. Like we're yeah. doing this, but yeah. they're not saying it because of judgment and expectation. Do you yes. have any like little tips for people on how to maybe move through that and just be brave for one post and put something out there that may change someone's life? Yeah. Or even if it doesn't change someone's life because we don't <laughs> all have to change lives that's right exactly and and you know it, it's really you know judgment is a massive massive thing and again that's something that comes from inside of us it's part of our inner voice that is there the ego that's there going don't put that on there because you never know what's going to happen and what I talk about as well when it comes to any form of communication is that we have these four fears that can hold us back so it's not generally about maybe going on lives or videos or posting something it's really about that we have a fear of either rejection failure humiliation and embarrassment or loss of power and control so the more that you can figure out which one are ones potentially for you about putting that post on that could hold you back from doing it but then just thinking about what some steps that you could do in order to still do it but you're okay no matter what happens if someone does say something about it but really it, it's, it's looking at the worst case scenario and it actually generally doesn't happen. If you're coming from a place of love and heart, then people will know that. And I think that the more that it's around empathy, um, emotional intelligence, then people will feel it a lot more than if it's in your head and it's being quite directive, um, depending what it is that you're wanting to share, but really just taking some time. Maybe it's just taking some notes. Maybe it's a post and you ask a friend. Maybe you say to someone like yourself and go, hey, I was just going to do this post. What do you reckon that this would maybe, you know, I suppose just asking someone else before you potentially post it. Say to people, if you want to record a video, send it to me and I'm more than happy to look over it for you. So I think asking someone and then looking at really what's the purpose of you doing the post or the video? Really, what do you want to, to, to voice um, and, and what do you want to do to help people? So the more that, again, you're flipping it over to the other people um, and maybe just asking for a bit, of a, a bit of a mentor for someone for yourself before you post it um, and, and go for it, really. Mm, absolutely. Hayley just uh, asked another cool question about um, whether yeah. emotional intelligence should be a subject in school because we do see people jump to, jumping to conclusions, you know, misconstruing what people are saying because we're so in our own heads and our own selfish perspective yeah. on things that we often treat people quite badly. Yeah, definitely. And 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 thank you, Haley. I mean, it, emotional intelligence is a massive passion for me um, as well. And it's something that I have developed myself. It's something that I go into organizations and teach as well. And definitely for schools, because when when people when children are children, if you're not able to be resilient and self-regulate yourself, when when you become an adult, like how do you then be able to do that for yourself if you haven't actually learned that? Um so you know it, yeah, emotional intelligence is something that definitely should be taught in school for sure. But I think as adults, then it is our responsibility as well to be able to self-regulate ourselves. But it's not about, I suppose, then that's where judgments comes into it when we haven't done it and we've got annoyed at somebody and we've 
you know, we've really been, um, we really kind of flew off the handle. And and then we go, oh, damn it, I've done it again. It's like, well, you know, we're only human and there is going to be times when we do do that. But I think the more that we can become aware of certain things that might happen or might trigger us, then we can go, hey, next time, you know, why don't I maybe stop or pause before I potentially say something back to someone? Um, so really the emotional intelligence starts with yourself and, and being gentle on yourself or certain things that you do nice point i i remember reading a book many years ago and i i can't remember the exact title it was called five tribes or something like that and yeah. the authors were talking about um the personal development industry and these five different levels of personal development that you can attain and they basically said most people live down the bottom where it's all about them it's everybody else's fault um but there's, you know, for those people who are truly gurus, you know, like the Dalai Lamas and yeah. you know, the people that you go, how can you be such an awesome person? Um, and I guess my question is there's so there's so, so much information for to develop yourself and to yeah. improve who you are. Why, I mean, you may not know the answer to this, but why that bottom chunk of people, why are they not getting the message that they can be better and they can improve their life because there's so many resources out there. And and I think as well that and, and this is only my own my own kind of opinion and my own experience with with people is I suppose remembering is that we don't know where people have been what they've been through. There's a lot of people that just it's too hard. It's too hard with things that have happened to them that they're like I just don't even want to go there. Um, you know, I've got people in my life, I've got family that, you know, that they're not on this journey that I'm on. Um, you know, a lot, lot of for them, it's very, it's very closed off. I was never brought up in a household that we openly had communication about things It just got swept under the carpet at every opportunity. It's like, oh, that just didn't exist, yeah. you know. <laughs> my family is yours. That's right, exactly. So I think as well, it's, you know, we have to, we have to remember that everybody's doing the best that they can. There's some people that will avoid it because it's maybe just too hard. Um, I mean, to really go into yourself and really be able to, you know, go into some of those skeletons and demons that you've got going on, it's sometimes it's really hard for people, even for me that, you know, now having a lot more time and I'm, I'm, I'm loving the fact that I can do a lot more self-care, but then I've had quite a, a number of, of, um, of triggers from my past have come up because you're having more time to do that. And I thought, I'm okay because I have the tools to be able to manage it. But then I thought, well, for a lot of people right now, in survival, in fear, in all of those things, there's part of your brains that if you're in that bottom section is that if you can go to that next level, there's there's a blockage in parts of your brain as well about not being able to, to go to that next level. And one, and I just want to share this as well with, with everybody and, and, and something that I've started using of late and Mel Robbins' five-second rule. And um, and I've known about it for a couple of years, but I've never actually really used it. And I've actually been using it for the last three weeks, especially getting up in the morning. Like I'm a super early person, do my meditation, do all of those things. But when life gets a bit hard or I'm super exhausted, I will snooze. And um, anyway, so for the last, I would say two and a half weeks, I have not snoozed. So for one week I did five, four, three, two, one. And now I don't even do that. The alarm goes off and I get up. But I started to use it in certain um, thought patterns, certain actions that I might go, hey, I'm at home, I might just not bother doing that. So, you know, I suppose for people, maybe it's just some super simple tool with like, you know, as soon as like you take five seconds more to do something, it's gone. Like you're gone. The other part of your brain is just like we're not doing it. Um, so I suppose that's the only thing that I can probably offer to people is, is that um, it, you, and I suppose there's so much out there is that you've got to be able to put the, the tools into practice. Like we can all read books every week and, and and listen to podcasts but if we don't do the work then it actually is, is is lost but I think we need to be for people who don't know where to turn to is that it's looking at something tangible and simple that you can follow 
Mm. Well, simple's always good because if we yeah. make things too complicated for people, then they just go, no, 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 it can't be. They, they, your five-second rule goes out the window because they're overwhelmed and, and cluttered. It's like, I'm not doing that. Get out of here. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I know that for myself. I, you know, there's certain things that I've just went, oh, well, five seconds is gone. I'm just not going to do it. Or, you know, we all do it in certain certain aspects of it. But yeah, it is really, you know, I suppose people that listen to people are here. And I think as well that people are when they're ready. So you might read a book, right, that you've read a year ago or listen to a certain podcast. And then you maybe a year later, you read it again and you listen. And you're like, I don't remember. I don't remember that part of it because you weren't ready at the time. Someone yeah. snuck and wrote it in while I was asleep. <laughs> yeah, exactly, I know. I mean, I generally listen to similar stuff all the time. And then I, because I think it's such a, we need to hear things on repetition. So I tend to spend a lot of time listening to the same types of people, same podcast, because I know that I will need to continue to hear it in order to get everything that I really need um, out of it. So I th again, I suppose um, some advice around that is that don't feel you have to go to the next new information that comes in. Listen to one podcast or read one book and read it several times because there'll be other information that will come through to you. Mm, that's a really good tip. And I know that um, I have done that, although I did do that with Stephen King's It. I don't think <laughs> that's what you're talking about. <laughs> no, not even close. But one of my favourite books is um, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari by oh, Robert yes. And it's just such a wonderful parable about you know, coming to that point in your life where you've gone, hey, the way I'm living is not serving me well yeah. and how can I go and change? It's an, an absolutely brilliant book and um, it'd be, uh, I hope that he comes and tours again when we're all allowed to go and see people. Yeah. Melanie, thank you for your insights. Your like, okay. it, There's something really interesting about accents because <laughs> I don't have an accent. You have an accent. And listening to that Scottish accent is just like captivating. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you get that all the time, but I could sit and listen to you forever. <laughs> Definitely, I do. And I think that's the one good thing. Um, not that there's just one thing about coming to Australia, but I think that's what I love about yeah, the storytelling aspect is people get drawn in by by accents, definitely. But you definitely Australians have an accent as well. I do love listening. I do love listening to different different people as well. But yeah. <laughs> I know when I go to America, because Americans love the the Aussies, the Irish yeah. and the and the Kiwis, there's something about our accent that they just are drawn to. Yeah. And last time I went, I would I just ham it up. I put on the really ochre Aussie, and they're like, "Oh my god, uh, that's a terrible American accent!" But oh my god, I love you, Aussies. And you're like, and it's amazing how many drinks and pats on the back yes. that you get. <laughs> yes, I was going to say I have used it to my advantage here here in Australia, especially at the beginning when I came here. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you've got to make you've got to make the most of your assets. I was, and I always say to them, they go, "I love your accent," and I go, "I don't have an accent. You're the one with the accent." And they're like, "Going what? <laughs> Stop messing with my head." <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, you got, thank you for spending this time with us this That's morning. Thank you Thank so much you. for being part of Obsessed with, um, yeah. you know, people like you who who share and, you know, who get into the spirit of what the group is that just makes it such a magical place to be. Yeah, thank you so much, and it's been super, super um, amazing to jump on this um, interview with you and just have an open conversation and, and so many people jumping on and listening to it as well. So thank you so much for the opportunity. I've absolutely loved connecting with you, and um, and, yeah, thank you. Awesome.